we are up to a decent number. Uh, so let's get going. We are already a couple of minutes late. Uh, it is such a delight to welcome my very, very good friend, Professor George Philander from Princeton. George will talk about uh, is global warming inhibiting an incipient ice age? Uh, sorry. <clears throat> so, um, George is an expert uh, in oceanography and he has made great contributions to climate science over the years. And uh, I don't want to say anything wrong. So George, correct me if I say something wrong. Uh, and he and I uh, uh, kind of have a lot of shared interests in the, in the education aspect, not to mention in the nonlinear aspect. So, uh, so it's been absolutely fantastic getting to uh, know him, work with him, interact with him for the past some years. Uh, I'll give a short bio uh, of George, uh, which is always going to be an underestimate of what George is. Uh, he was born in South Africa. Uh, where rational science was an escape from the horrors of irrational apartheid. And uh, in the, in, he was, uh, he attended the University of Cape Town. He got a degree in physics and math in 1962. And then uh, he came to Harvard for a PhD, which he obtained around 1970. And uh, let me read something that George wrote, which I actually had on, on the notice, but since he wrote it himself, uh, it'll be nice if I read it, I suppose. Uh, so, so he writes, I was born in South Africa where, ra where rational science was an escape from the horrors of irrational apartheid. In the early 1960s, I continued my studies at Harvard University. Um, there shielded uh, from American apartheid, my scientific activities were rewarding and stimulating, and so was my social life. But these two worlds were far apart. Discussions of the war in Vietnam and of interactions between the oceans and the atmosphere that produce El Nino uh, were divorced from one another, um, even though they involved the same friends and, and colleagues. Uh, the scientific activities came to a paradoxical climax in 1982, the year of the most intense El Nino event in the century. Our measurements described, our theories explained, and our computer models simulated uh, that event, but the information was available only after the event had occurred. We had been practicing little science, satisfying curiosity about natural phenomena, but neglected big science, which provides practical information. Today, the polarization of global warming calls for a balance between small and big science. Workshops developed in South Africa, devoted to explain why planet Earth is habitable and are very successful, are, are very successful at attracting students in science. And when he talks about students, he talks about both the white and the black students, but are, at, but are accessible to only a few hundred students a year. The challenge is to scale up. I added that George, like I said, George got his degrees in 62 and 70. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, George has received too many prizes to list in the space I have. So I'm sorry about that, George. Uh, he received the 2017 Vettelaysen Prize with Mark Cain. He's a fellow of the American Geophysical Union and the American Meteorological Society. He has received many honorary doctorates. Uh, one of them is an honorary DSC from the University of Cape Town in 2007. So with that, George, it's all yours. You can get, get rolling. I'm sorry, I took up a little bit of your time, but we are good to go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sirajit. It, it's a privilege for me to speak to this community. I've been a rather erratic participant in your Saturday seminars. And what intrigued me most is, is I see our big, big problems today, not just in the US, but globally, is that uh, our support, namely the layman, have lost confidence in us. And so it's really our job to restore that. Well, why do people no longer trust science? And I must confess, I, I blame the elite to some extent, that we're very keen on giving advice. And uh, being from South Africa, the, the last thing you need is some smart aleck come and tell you that you shouldn't burn coal. Uh, 
South Africa builds coal because to keep the mines dry and they need the mines to get the gold, which is the income. Anyway, you cannot tell poor people that the future will be worse. And so our planet is so amazing that I tried when I went back in 2007, I tried to use earth science as a vehicle to get students interested in science. And it, it works like a charm. So uh, we'll come back to that. What I propose to do here is speak for the next 45 minutes or so about the science of global warming, uh, how I see the current problems, and then open for discussion. And I hope to interest you. Uh, what impresses me most is as I see the challenge as bridging what I call the worlds of science and of human affairs. And your field, uh, that's exactly what you seem to be doing. At one of the early seminars I attended, it was before the election, somebody actually tried to predict the outcome of the 2020 election, uh, which sort of impressed me that we were, uh, elections is entirely political, uh, that somebody would use mathematics to try and anticipate a political event. Anyway, uh, election, the, the prediction does not be wrong, but just trying was to be an encouraging sign. But then we get back to the science. So I'll, that's, I, what I propose to do is describe briefly what the main problems are in earth science, because they, we've just had uh, a big report come out, it's called the IPCC, uh, United Nations Committee. And it was, uh, it was all about gloom and doom. And uh, we need to also give people hope. So uh, there's another perspective on this issue of global warming, and I'll try to give that. So let's start out with a fairly easy problem. If you look at this top slide here, it shows essentially what amounts to changes in Earth's temperature over the past 60 million years. And what you see is Earth starting at a very high temperature, so high that there were no glaciers at the time, around 60 million years ago. And then because of processes related to plate tectonics movement of continents, uh, that movement affects the atmospheric concentration of CO2, the earth cooled down. And this created opportunities for all sorts of weird mammals. Uh, and it's called the Cenozoic. And in due course, we African hominids appear. And that was about 3 million or maybe 4 million years ago. And what happened subsequently is rather bizarre. The climate started to fluctuate and the fluctuations grew in amplitude. And we arrived very recently. And at first we didn't amount to much, but we've taken advantage of the most recent of the brief periods that interrupt the current ice ages. So the, the, the bottom of those fluctuations would be an enormous ice age, uh, much of North America completely under ice, and the peaks are interglacial periods. And we, our species took advantage of the most recent of these interglacials and uh, made amazing advances into agriculture, various civilizations and so forth. Uh, if the only information you had was that top graph, uh, you would say that an ice age, ice age is imminent. Uh, these interglacials do not last very long. Uh, however, uh, if I ask you how long, uh, how soon will that happen? If you look at the time scale, you say, oh, any millennium now. So there's really no cause for concern. The ice age may be imminent, but it, it's going to be very, very far away. However, if I then go to the bottom uh, plots, now we have two, uh, we see essentially the same fluctuations up and down, so it might say just, but we have additional information. Uh, we not only the temperature, but also the carbon side of the atmosphere. And then we notice we're in the interglacial, and for some intriguing reasons, it's persisting quite a long time. It's been the temperate climate we experience has been that way now for 10,000 years almost. But we took advantage advance so rapidly that an inadvertent byproduct of our activities, uh, releasing CO2 into the atmosphere, is causing that red spike. 
Now, uh, I should point out this bottom curve correlates very highly with the top one. And that's reassuring because the top one comes from drilling into the ocean floor. And uh, the people who produced these curves, they didn't measure temperature. They measured some isotope. It happens to be oxygen 18 ratio, oxygen 16 to 18 is the top one. And one of the things I want to emphasize, it, it's actually difficult to understand how these paleontologists know what they know. They're very clever people. They produce these fascinating results. But we need to make an effort to find out how they get this information. Anyway, so the, the bottom one is really reassuring because it's from ice core. And here they drilled into the ice in Antarctica. And in the ice, air bubbles are trapped. And so the measurement of CO2 is actually an accurate measurement of uh, CO2 in the past. And we noticed that interglacials correspond to high CO2, and the ice ages correspond to low CO2. So we can imagine that it now becomes uncertain that this rise in CO2 may inhibit this ice age that we inferred from the top panel. So if we go to the next curve, uh, th this was obtained from various uh, cores, it's either the sea floor or the ice. And the time scale, the, the various problems with this, uh, the horizontal coordinate sh should be depth, uh, rate of deposition of these cores onto the sea floor or on the ice. How do you convert depth to time? So there have been big debates about it about that. And it turns out th th these records were not available uh, until about 1976, quite recently, whereas people knew about the ice ages. George, uh, George, I have a question. You said horizontal is about depth, but horizontal in what you are showing is time. Uh, am time. I? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You're still on the first slide. That, that's, that's what I wanted to verify. That's where you wanted to be. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's right. still the slide, yeah. So, okay. so anyway, so, so the, I just want to show how much uncertainty there is and how we don't really know how, uh, what other things going to plea for, I hope, that you're interested in. There needs to be more communication between uh, what I would call reductionists, people who believe that you can explain phenomena in terms of a few equations, and those equations describe the laws of uh, physics. Natural phenomena. And then there are people, um, Darwin, when he came up with these origins of man theory, the evolution, was asked whether his theory was consistent with uh, Newton's laws. And he wrote back and said it's entirely consistent, but the laws do me no good. I can't try on a few equations that show, therefore, there is man. Uh, I have to tell a story. And so these people tell stories, and it actually leads to friction. Uh, you know, different branches of science believe them. Basically, the reductionists believe themselves to be superior to the storytellers. And things like the, the demise of the dinosaurs has led to big debates, as led to the front page of the newspaper, the famous physicist declared the paleontologists are stamp collectors. Uh, their response was, what's wrong with collecting stamps? <laughs> Anyway, yeah, I'm digressing. Uh, but let me continue with the next picture, which uh, oh, it's just a brief history of what happened. So the, the people who in the 19th century discovered there had been ice ages did so on the basis, it's quite amazing, strictly on the basis of measurements of land. And they would come across boulders such as this one here. And it's, they call these errant boulders. And how on earth did this boulder get there? And if you walk along in, in Switzerland, you come across such boulders. You look around, you see a glacier in the distance, and you conclude that this glacier must have carried the boulder back, and the, the glacier melted, retracted, leaves the boulder there. And I'm, I'm still amazed by how much they accomplished on the basis of such inferences. They uh, discovered that there had been recurrent ice ages, and the fellow called Malenkovich proposed that uh, sunlight variations in sunlight because of orbital parameters was the cause of this. Milenkovic, there was no computer around, and so Milenkovic could make his calculation by hand, but only for one location. He did it for 65 north in June, because that's where the glaciers are biggest. And to this day, you can find papers on paleoclimate 
and they will show some Lenski five more in June. So uh, in the meanwhile, in 1976, there seemed to be some evidence for Milenkovich. Uh, people had discovered isotopes, they had thrown into the seafloor, they got the curves I just showed you. And lo and behold, if you do a spectral analysis of those curves, there are three peaks, and th these numbers are worth remembering. Uh, these are approximate 20,000, 40,000, and 100,000 kilo year. And those turn out to be the periods of precession of the Earth's axis, of changes in the tilt of the axis, the implicity, and of changes in the eccentricity of Earth's orbit. And so this seemed to be vindication of Merenkovich's theory because uh, you go to astronomy, you come up with numbers, you'll go to seafloor cores and you come up with the same numbers. Uh, however, if you go back to that picture, uh, it turns out the ice agency only started about 3 million years ago. Uh, there was no change in sunlight significantly that caused this. So what happens up and then around a million years, things change again. So over here, obliquity signals are dominant to do a spectral analysis. Over here, you can see it's called a sawtooth. It's simply a sawtooth because the deglaciation, it's, it's easy to melt snow. It takes a lot longer to build up a glacier. And so this is called a sawtooth signal. The sawtooth signal only becomes important over, after one million years. Oh, again, without any significant change in sunlight variations. So the big questions are, uh, what happened three million years ago? It was not a change in sunlight. Why was obliquity initially the dominant signal? And why is the sawtooth, why did it wait until 0.8 million? And then it becomes the dominant signal. The people who wrote this paper in 1976 found that the most energetic signal is this 100k one, and it's related to changes in its, or is associated with changes in its eccentricity. The changes in eccentricity are so minute, so tiny, that they questioned whether that can be responsible for the most energetic signal in the record. And they suggested, they did some of the amusing story, apparently one of them had just had a pacemaker implanted in his heart <laughs> to keep the pace going. And he suggested that maybe eccentricity is just a pacemaker for natural variations. In other words, is it possible that these fluctuations would be there, but would be irregular, except for the, uh, what I'll call the Milankovitch cycles that add these peaks at these periods. So, this means that if there was no Milankovitch forcing, and I'm going to refer to these three periods of the Milankovitch forcing, if that was completely absent, we would still have ice ages. Uh, the only problem is they'd be irregular. Uh, and so what these periods do is give us these tidy looking records. Now, yeah, I want to just point out an analogy with study of sea surface height fluctuations. If you look at the ocean surface, there's a very rich spectrum of variability. It goes from seconds to minutes to hours. And superimposed on that spectrum are very sharp peaks at the tides. There's a 12.6 hour tide, there's a 24 hour tide and so forth. And it turns out the plus throw down the equations for basically a layer of water for the ocean called the plus tidal equations. And if you ignore any forcing in those equations, you can study the spectrum of sea surface height fluctuations. Uh, how does the wind generate the waves you see that people are surfing and so forth. You can test, and it turns out there are three types of waves in such an ocean, uh, very different periods. You can have a dispersion diagram. You can test those results by looking at the tides. So you can, so the tides really amount to experiment that nature does. It forces the ocean at certain very specific periods in a very precise manner. And if we have a theory for the spectrum, we can test that theory by seeing if it produces the right waves at the period that nature forces. And this is basically what I would like to propose that we try to do 
I have some suggestion on how to proceed. And I will argue that the test for climate theories should be to look at these peaks. So in speaking to Dr. S Dr. Sen, uh, he surprised me by saying that physicists in general are not particularly knowledgeable about ocean atmosphere climate. And so I thought I'd give a brief introduction to the atmosphere of the ocean. So my main proposal is that what was wrong with Milenkovic's theory is that he asked the wrong question. He asked, why do glaciers wax and wane? And people became convinced that the glaciers are responding to sunlight and the glaciers waxing and waning then induce climate signals everywhere else. They, they have such a powerful effect. And I would claim that that's really the wrong question to ask, that it assumes that the atmosphere obligingly will bring water vapor, mostly from the tropics for the building of glaciers. And that the ocean will give up uh, this quite passively. It, uh, the water that evaporates to build the glaciers uh, is all fresh. And as a consequence, the ocean salinity goes up enormously when glaciers are built. Anyway, all those factors were ignored. And so uh, uh, it turns out I'm very proposed that the ice ages are really a consequence of interactions between glaciers, the atmosphere, and the ocean. But those three fields are, or those three media are so profoundly different that we should expect surprising things when they interact. Uh, let me just start with the atmosphere. The atmosphere is this very thin shield of gases over our planet. The thickness is about 10 kilometers to the troposphere. And somebody said if the atmosphere is, if the earth was an apple, uh, the atmosphere would be about as thick as the skin of the apple. Right? The, the, the Earth radius is 6,000 something kilometers. This is about 10 kilometers, the thickness of the atmosphere. On top of that is the stratosphere. And so uh, the stratosphere is uh, led, uh, temperatures there increase with elevation. It, it's where airplanes fly. If, if you take a commercial flight, uh, pilots prefer up in the stratosphere. There's very little turbulence. So the big Questions looking here, we can see the atmosphere. We see the tall stratus clouds over there. They reach the stratosphere and then they stop to spread out. And the atmosphere is remarkable. It serves us as a blanket, as a parasol, as a shield, and it distributes water to great climatic zones. It's a blanket because of the greenhouse effect. And if you do the right calculations, today we're very concerned about carbon dioxide but the most important greenhouse gas is actually water vapor. Okay? And the atmosphere gets that from the ocean. It serves as a parasol because of some of that water vapor turns into clouds that reflect sunlight. So uh, the earth has a, a huge albedo, 0.3, 30% of the sunlight we receive is reflected, right? Uh, so it, during the day, the earth shields us from sunlight at night, it traps heat, and keeps us warm. Uh, it also distributes water, it creates climatic zones. So let me just briefly, what I did here was to list some of the properties of the atmosphere. It's, only, it's about 10 kilometers deep. The main thing is it's transparent to magnetic waves with sunlight. And so the Earth, the atmosphere is heated from below. Convection is important, turbulence is of extreme importance in the atmosphere. Uh, the atmosphere is very low density, it's very swift. If you change sunlight, for example, the seasons change in sunlight, changes the whole global atmospheric circulation. Forget about it. It has very tiny heat capacity in comparison with the ocean. So th this very quick, very fast, uh, transparent medium is going to interact with the ocean. And the main thing about the ocean, it's opaque to sunlight. Uh, and uh, as a consequence, the, the deep ocean by deep is it's probably just a few tens of meters down. It's, it's actually pitch dark. And uh, we cannot, it makes measurements very difficult. Uh, we cannot use electromagnetic waves. And 
oceanography they were developed quite differently from atmospheric science. Uh, our Navy, by the way, hides the submarines there. We ourselves don't know where the submarines are until they come back to the surface. And so much of the funding of oceanography is the Navy trying to find out how you can measure the time variability. That's another story. The other thing is that the ocean is remarkably free of turbulence, except for the very shallow surface layer where the wind is blowing fiercely. But below that, there's almost no, and it becomes a problem for climate modelers because what, the way you solve the equations uh, is going to introduce in effect some form of friction. Uh, we can come back to that later on. Uh, and then the, the heat capacity of the ocean is so much, much bigger than that of the atmosphere. Uh, a place such as uh, Honolulu, Hawaii, has almost no seasonal variation in temperature. Uh, the ocean is such an enormous heat bath. Uh, contrast that with uh, a place on land, places such as Chicago, which doesn't have the protection of the water resource. So all these factors make interaction between the ocean and atmosphere very difficult. To study the atmosphere, I, uh, I hope you can see this little, I'm going to see everybody's familiar with this, but uh, what drives atmospheric circulation is the equator to pole temperature gradient. And as a consequence, we have westerly winds in the latitudes where we live. We have easterly winds in the tropics. The easterly winds came as a big surprise to the early explorers. Why should there be easterlies? It, it turns out quite a complicated problem. Uh, this is a very idealized model. This is clean sphere. But there are regions where air rises and it transports both angular momentum and moisture poleward. And there's elaborate theories for this, but in atmospheric science, you go a long way by starting with the water covered globe and looking, in other words, you allow no longitudinal variations and you get these winds driven by the pressure gradients. The winds go unstable, that's how you get weather and so forth. So the ocean by contrast, continents are of essential importance because you can then introduce pressure gradients in the ocean. You can pile up the water on one side if you have easterlies or westerlies. And you, the main thing about the ocean is its peculiar density structure. The ocean, if you go to the warmest place in the ocean, say on the equator near the date line, the water there is about 30 degrees centigrade warm and you make measurements of the ocean floor. If you calculate the average of those measurements, uh, it's barely above freezing point. So the ocean is basically in the tropics, especially a two layer system, a very shallow layer about 100 meters deep of warm water and sharp transition and below that uniformly cold water. And as I said, the presence of continents create barriers. And we'll come back to that later in case of currents. So one of the things the ocean and atmosphere jointly do is to create climatic zones. Uh, this is a picture of cloud of a concentration, but you, uh, you can easily see uh, the Sahara, the tropical jungles. That's Lake Victoria, where fertilizer is being used so much that the lake itself is now being overgrown with vegetation. That's the outflow of the Congo River. That's the outflow of the Amazon there. There's a parent that carries the water northward. But what I want to emphasize in this picture is rainfall distribution is highly variable. We have completely different climatic zones in different regions. The ocean too has climatic zones. And the equator becomes a very special line. You can see this is where Captain Ahab went looking for Moby Dick. Uh, lots of whales down here because it's very rich in nutrients. Another very part rich in nutrients is down here. Much of the CO2 we put into the atmosphere, humans do, go back into the ocean uh, around this region. Okay, so from this picture, 
you can see that the climate, all of this is very variable. Each of these regions has a distinctive seasonal cycle and so on. Uh, I want to turn just to the equator. Why is the equator so special? And evidence that the ocean and atmosphere interact can be found in this picture. The one is a picture of sea surface temperature today. And this is a picture of rainfall. And there's a surprisingly high correlation that the water, it, it rains heavily in the tropics where the water is warm, over these regions. And then over here, it's very warm. Uh, over here, it's extremely cold. So these white as regions of no rainfall, but they nonetheless cloudy. Uh, these are low level stratus clouds that form over cold water. If you fly from California to Hawaii, meaning from somewhere there to there, if you look down, you'll see clouds all the time, all the way. Those are stratus clouds. And this can become a big part of the story because the clouds reflect sunlight and the water is cold. And so they actually contribute to the coldness of the water. And I'm going to call these regions for the tropical counterparts of glaciers. They have their own uh, albedo because of these stratus clouds. And I'm going to argue that these actually interact with the glaciers and in tandem, they can contribute to climate fluctuations. The most surprising aspect of this picture is about this asymmetry, is the presence of cold water at the equator. It, people get very excited about El Nino and then they'll say, El Nino brings warm water here, and affects the climate globally and so forth. Uh, the ancient Greeks would have been astonished to find that the water is cold at the equator. In fact, the, the most surprising thing is why on earth is the water so cold? Uh, it's an unnatural state. It would be much more obvious if the water here were warm. And we'll come back, it, it's related to the, this issue again. The one particular consequence here is that if you go to Panama, it's about 15 north over there, it's in this middle of warm water. It, basically a tropical jungle, right? There's big cumulus clouds, there's heavy vegetation. If you go 15 south, you find that over here, you go to Lima, it's never rained in Lima. The motor cars are sold without windshield wipers. Uh, Lima basically is very cloud. If you, if you go there, you look at the sky, it's overcast, but it's these stratus clouds that don't bring any rain. And so it's a puzzle. Why is the southern hemisphere? We, we, we lost your voice, uh, George. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, no, anyway, you're the, okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the big puzzle here is why is the southern hemisphere favored with the cold water? Why this is called the intertropical convergence zone. If you ask what's happening here, I had the earlier picture of the you saw the winds converging onto the intertropical convergence zone and they converge onto this band and the question is why is this band north of the equator why isn't it south of the equator and th th there are various factors that determine this and there are actually currently debates and the models we have the big climate models that predict future global warming have considerable trouble with this asymmetry uh, they actually will have a double ITCZ, many of them. Uh, this line will also be a south of the equator. So I just want to emphasize the IPCC report, uh, this just came out a week ago, it's actually a wonderful political statement. It tells you what scientists agree about. One complaint I have, it does not tell you what scientists do not agree about. There are many unsolved problems in this business. And I think to attract people to science, people such as you, uh, we should mention some of the unsolved problems and how at the moment, the predictions for future global warming uh, has uncertainties. And we can reduce those uncertainties if we can try to, if we can start to explain these uh, peculiar phenomena. So let me just go back quickly to the ocean. So we have the ocean with this peculiar temperature field south of the equator, and it has this peculiar thermocline, 
which is very shallow. It shields very warm surface water from the water depth. And the question is, how does how do the current maintain this peculiar thermal structure? And the water at depth is so uniform in temperature. Uh, anyway, the water at depth is so uniform in temperature that it uh, was concluded that the water in the deep ocean below the thermocline must be from very small regions in high latitudes because neither salinity nor temperature varies significantly below the thermocline. It's all above it. And this thermohaline circulation, it's everybody knows about it. I'm impressed with the geochemists, how they succeeded in making the public aware of this. This week in the newspapers, there was again word that it's weakening. And I should point out the time scale is extremely long. For this water will sink there into the deep ocean, spread around. And the oldest water, it takes about a thousand years to get here. And so people, they have various isotopes, carbon-14, carbon-16. They can track this water. It, it's too slow to be measured directly by means of current meters, uh, but instead it can be traced by means of chemical tracers. The snag with this is where we know where the water goes down. We do not know where the water comes back up. And at first it was thought that this thermocline is maintained through the upwelling of water everywhere to counter the downward diffusion of heat. So how do you explain that the 30 degrees centigrade water at the surface, why doesn't that heat diffuse downwards? And it turns out you can write some equations, the diffusivity you get from such a calculation is enormous, far, far bigger than anything measured. I mentioned that the ocean is forced from above and the diffusivity in the deep ocean is extremely low. In the end, it was decided that the only place the water really comes up is around Antarctica. And that the water, the density difference between surface and bottom is so small, the water really comes up. So this picture is actually wrong. Uh, there's no water coming up here. The, the surface waters the, uh, recirculate. It's a complicated circulation. And part of it are the shallow surface currents. And this is a plot of surface particles over a period of, uh, well, I think, 20 years. Uh, it's a model that accurately simulates currents. This is the Kirishio in the Pacific. There's a corresponding current in the Atlantic, the Gulf Stream. The particles are released there, and this shows them as they move week by week. So where the dots are far apart, the current is swift. Where the dots are very close together, the currents are very slow. The color indicates the depth. So here the particle is at the surface, it goes down, in due course it will get back to the surface. So this is a very shallow circulation. Over here, some of the water moves to the equator. It sends current along the equator, it moves, and the water wells up. You can see it coming back to the surface here. That's why this water is very cold. Okay, so we have these two systems of currents and the schematic diagram of that is over here. So you have this very shallow water that goes down here at about 30 degrees north, it flows wells up at the equator, it's because of the winds flows. And then you have the separate water here goes all the way to the farm north and the Atlantic sinks, comes back. So you have this very complicated circulation. It turns out this is a picture for the Atlantic. For the Pacific, this deep part, there's no sinking at the far north. And the reason can be seen here, this is the salinity of the ocean. It turns out the Atlantic is far more saline than the Pacific. It rains heavily in the Pacific Ocean. That's why the water here is so fresh. And in general, it's a puzzle for, for how long has this been the case? We, we don't really know. But today, the Atlantic has sinking because it's so saline the water that reaches far north, as you should mention in the equation of state for seawater, it, it's accident of 
that the effect of changes in temperature and the effect of changes in salinity uh, are tiny and they are comparable in magnitude. And so you can change the density, the density gradient for the water going equator with wells up to go poleward, its density must stay fairly high so that it can sink when it gets up there. And this salinity contributes to that. In the Pacific, it doesn't sink. So at the moment, there's speculation, there was talk in the newspapers that this current that carry water north, that people claim it keeps England fairly warm. Uh, freshly, the Greenland ice should melt. It will basically create this ocean. And this circulation will falter and our climate will change radically. So you could even argue that nature's done that experiment for us, this will become the Pacific. The Pacific is like this. And that the moment, it, so in the Pacific, you only have this sinking, you do not have the sinking at high latitude. Uh, is that a reality? How do we check if this is indeed the case? The second question is what would happen if you shut this off also? Suppose you release enough fresh water that this also shuts down. And the result, we did some numerical experiment, is an intriguing one. You take an ocean basin, and this is looking down on it. And in your basic state where you start, the wind is such that you cause upwelling along the equator. And the thermoclines, this is a function of depth, slope. So the eastern Pacific is cold, the western Pacific is warm. Then in this model, you pour fresh water onto the surface. And you find that this shrinks. And in due course, it can collapse altogether. In other words, there is a threshold associated with this. And this threshold can cause the a complete collapse. Uh, we can induce, I, I call this a permanent El Nino, which is unfortunate. That's nothing to do with El Nino. I'll fit to that in a second. But I want to point out there's a threshold. So, so much for background. I'm sort of running out of time. So, I want to get quickly to interpreting the paleo records in terms of these results I've just tried to summarize. Uh, the, this map shows the heat flux across the ocean surface today, averaged over a fairly long period, a few decades. You notice that the ocean gains lots of heat at the equator, simply because the water there is cold. It loses heat over here. And this is mostly the Kurushio is a very warm current. The Gulf Stream is a warm current. Cold air in winter blowing over here will cause huge evaporation. So you get fog banks where the cold air is blowing over the cold water, especially the cold air over the warm water. In a state of equilibrium, the ocean has a heat budget. And averaged over here, imagine the ocean has a free surface, imagine that the bottom and the sides are insulated, then there must be a time scale sufficiently long that the net flux across the surface must be there, it must have a balanced seed budget. So if these zones were absent, you would be in this world over here, right? The ocean heat, it would be like Hawaii today, the, this moves up and down, but it, currents are not really involved. It's simply the ocean has a huge heat capacity. To get to this world, you have to cross that barrier I just had. Uh, you have to cross this barrier, and then you'll get into the world where the heat budget is active. So in an active heat budget, suppose you shut this off because of, say, the global warming. And the moment we're decreasing the loss of heat of the Earth to the space. So the Earth gains more heat in low latitudes, loses heat in high latitudes. The atmosphere transports heat poleward for that purpose, and so do the oceans. Suppose we shut down the oceanic loss of heat over here by means of global warming. At first, the time scale is now going to be many decades. At first, heat keeps on pouring in here. 
this is going to lower the thermocline. It's going to cause a shrinkage of the upwelling zone. And in due course, there will be a new balance. But the new balance will be a world similar to this one. So we're moving from a world in which the ocean is absorbing heat at the moment in the tropics. And if we shut down the extratropical loss, we'll in due course be here. And the whole point of this argument is that the glaciers have a life of their own because they have an albedo. Once you have a glacier, it reflects sunlight, which creates conditions that favor the expansion of a glacier. I can make the same argument for tropical upwelling zones. Once you have a tropical upwelling zone such as this, it's covered with stratus clouds. The stratus clouds keep the water cold and that can cause a tropical upwelling zone to expand. Uh, so by interfering with the heat budget, you can. And so I want to make the proposal that the glaciers and the tropical upwelling zones are partners and they fluctuate in tandem. Now, this is a rather wild speculation. So I'm claiming that in the absence of Milankovitch forcing, there would be feedbacks of this type. And the question then is, how on earth do I test this feedback? And I want to now go back and argue, A, let me interpret the climate record on the basis of the results I've just given you. I said that initially 60 million years ago, the earth was very warm so warm there were no glaciers. I would claim that at that time we were in a state where the ocean was a passive source of moisture for the atmosphere. Uh, the cooling that occurred cooled the deep ocean and caused the thermocline to rise. And around three million years ago, the thermocline appears at the surface. So if you ask you know, why up to three million years ago, where there are no huge climate fluctuations comparable to ice ages, I would say because the ocean was not participating. There, there were fluctuations, but it was entirely atmospheric and it was in a world of this type down here. Around three million years ago, the thermocline, this thermocline that I leave it up, this world came into existence. And I have over here, some pictures of measurements at various places. You can see that the Western Pacific has always been warm, but the Eastern Pacific and various other places on the planet have been cooling off regularly. The, so how do I test this hypothesis? And I would claim that the best test is obliquity. If I change the tilt of the Earth's axis, suppose I make the tilt uh, bigger, then the poles will get more sunlight, but the tropics will get less sunlight. So obliquity, all it does is redistribute sunlight and the net amount of sunlight the earth receives doesn't change. However, because there's cold water at the equator and because there's a feedback of the clouds, it's possible that it can amplify. So the obliquity signals of considerable importance as a test for this phenomenon. And in fact, sea surface temperatures we found out earlier, sea surface temperature at the equator does not depend on local sunlight. It depends on the depth of the thermocline. And so these, the sawtooth, the, the obliquity and the sawtooth, remember that the sawtooth is there simply because of feedbacks. Obliquity is a, a feed, is a forced, uh, signal, uh, the redistribution of sunlight. And you can see how obliquity can become the pacemaker for a sort of threshold. And what's remarkable about this is that, uh, I think I'm running out of time. So what's remarkable is that if you look, so here's the, the famous curve originally, uh, there are the glacial maxima down here, the interglacial setup there. There is the clear sawtooth signal. This is the record from the ice with the seafloor cause. The paleontologists define, in my opinion, rather arbitrarily, 
they define one, two, three, four. They call this is basically a taxonomy for ice ages. Uh, they believe that uh, the shaded parts should have much in common and bright parts. Uh, I find a bit puzzling. So I introduced a, a different climatology and I claim we should use these points as the boundaries. And so the yellow columns show where you have deglaciation and the white parts are periods of glaciation. And what we find, they, they follow a, a rule. And in fact, uh, Peter Weibus at Harvard uh, looked at the last 36 uh, uh, significant ice ages and found that in 33 of them, 33 out of 36, what happened, you can see here, the black line is the increase in obliquity, the red line is precession, where we haven't discussed yet. But these all coincide with the increase in obliquity. So when increase obliquity interfere with the heat budget, you produce that result. Uh, what is intriguing is this yellow, is the green one. It's the only example where deglaciation occurred when obliquity was not increasing. And for this, we have to turn to precession. So what's striking to me is that out of 36 cases where it was looked at, only three of them were of this type. And so the three exceptions become particularly valuable tests for this. I hope I explained adequately. I spoke for nearly an hour. I should stop soon. I want to say just a few words about precession. Uh, so obliquity is one test that the Earth's sunlight variations at a very precise frequency. We know the spatial structure, it's merely a redistribution. And it induces the same response that uh, we get from the sawtooth signal. And so it's, it's so similar to the sawtooth that it becomes its pacemaker. So, so this is a fairly straightforward test we should be able to do. And a particularly important test will be this big exception. For the big exception, we have to turn to precession. And so let me say something about precession quickly. Precession depends on the eccentricity of Earth's orbit. If the Earth's orbit were a circle, it wouldn't matter that the axis precesses. So we have two dates for say, uh, associated with precession and with obliquity. Obliquity gives us the solstices, right? So June 21, December 21 are special dates. Uh, the Northern Hemisphere is favored with more sunshine in January, I mean, this December 21. The, anyway, we're all familiar with the solstices. Precession does the same. It changes the date of perihelion when we're closest to the sun. At the moment, we're closest to the sun on January 3rd, which is very really close to December 21. And so we find that the Southern Hemisphere at the moment is favored with more sunlight in its summer than in the Northern Hemisphere in its summer. Uh, 10,000 years ago, that's the opposite. Uh, because precession is constantly, I'm sorry, perihelion is constantly changing with time. But what I want to show you is, is first a record of rainfall in Chinese caves. And it, it's, they're quite a low latitude, uh, they're barely inside the tropics, I think. Uh, they come from stalagmites. And what they tell us is that they give us a measure of rainfall. And so rainfall, we need a nonlinearity for precession, since precession redistributes sunlight over the course of a year. The response to precession must be nonlinear for it to generate a long-term signal. So what happens in the case of the monsoons, it rains heavily in summer, not in winter. Uh, hence, as precession moves, when precession is small, uh, the, it means that the Earth's orbit is almost a circle. Uh, and in that case, the rainfall 
is neg uh, the change in rainfall is negligible. When precession is large over year, uh, say that value, then we find that rainfall in summers increased a lot. So the average rainfall over the course of a year is actually quite nonlinear. It depends only on the density of sunlight in summer, not on the average intensity over the year. It doesn't depend on, you, you can't make zero smaller than that. So th there's this remarkable correlation from these caves between rainfall and precession. And the modulation you see, it's much bigger here, is simply the effect of precession depends on the eccentricity of this orbit. If the eccentricity is small, then precession is small, if eccentricity is big. So you get this, and so this period of 20, uh, anyway, it, it's an uh, excellent proof for the nonlinearity of response to precession uh, in the case of monsoonal rains. If this theory is right, then the Chinese cave rainfall record should be out of phase with caves in Brazil. And in fact, there are caves in Brazil and it strongly supports that. Similarly in Africa, uh, the Sahara 10,000 years ago had heavy uh, rains, so heavy that you had lakes in the Sahara. And on the other hand, the Southern hemisphere was dry. Uh, the reverse is now the case, the Southern Hemisphere, the Sahara is now a desert and so forth. So uh, there's lots of support for this response to precession. The puzzle with precession is when you look at the Eastern Equatorial Pacific, and also when you look at the glaciers, this is a record I've shown before of ice volume. Why did precession not induce anything here? Uh, here you see it similarly. At P, precession is very large. Uh, at Q, precession is small. And I would submit that the reason for these is uh, different than linearity. Uh, this is the seasonal cycle near the Galapagos Islands as a function of latitude. And uh, at the Galapagos Islands, if you were to go there in September, October, it will be very dry it will be very cold. If you go there March, it will be warm and rainy. Uh, the strange thing is the sun crosses the equator twice a year. Why is this? If you go to Singapore, it rains at this time and it rains at this time. So the rainfall in Singapore is actually quite different from the rainfall near the Galapagos. In the Eastern Pacific, the seasonal cycle is highly nonlinear. The, very, the colors here indicate sea surface temperature. The contours indicate rainfall. And so the rainfall is very heavy over here. Uh, it's very dry over here. It doesn't rain at this time. And the arrows indicate the winds. And there's an explanation for why the Eastern Pacific is so nonlinear. Again, it has to do with the shallow thermocline. But it also implies if we go back in time, there should be times when the thermocline is deep, in which case the nonlinearity disappears and the precision signal can tell us. So, so I'm going to stop there. There's big debates at the moment uh, about this. For, for example, I'll just quickly mention what's going on here is that remember the equator is cold and there was warm water north, cold water south. It causes cross equatorial winds. The cross equatorial winds cause upwelling there, causes downwelling there. So they may in fact maintain this instability that keeps the ITCZ north of the equator. Um, I have a theory that the coast of Peru is such that the reason for this, uh, is, well, you can see here, uh, the coast of Peru is such that the trade winds are parallel to the coast. Yeah, they parallel the coast, but by the time they're switching towards the equator, this region is the region of very high sea surface thing. Anyway, I claim that coastal geometry is part of the reason we have this current asymmetry between Panama and uh, Peru, uh, Lima, Peru. Uh, if that is the case, that asymmetry should not have been there three million years ago when the thermocline was shallow. Uh, 
So, so in, in summary, what's needed at this stage is closer collaboration between paleo people who produce data of this type and modelers who try to explain this. Uh, the story that Professor Sen read about my life starting in South Africa, if you've asked, I'm now an old man, what have I learned? Uh, what I've learned is that we cannot divorce our science from what I call the world of human affairs. That the, the reason I mentioned 1982 was a big surprise. We paid attention strictly to science for the sake of science. We didn't bother to make a prediction and we got into trouble. There's a wonderful book by the Solar Price about little science into big science. And I highly recommend it. We organize ourselves quite differently depending on whether we do big science or small science. What I'm pushing for is at the moment, climate change is dominated by big science. We have international committees that decide on an agenda that dictate, we try to be very useful practical results. We're neglecting the beauty. I mean, what's going to attract ordinary laymen to science? And I would submit that a picture such as this one is absolutely spectacular. That if the puzzles posed here doesn't attract you, you're not going to be a scientist. That we have to start doing, it's sometimes called science for or the first director of the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton uh, wrote a paper in 1939 in which he says the usefulness of useless knowledge. And he, he created the Institute of Advanced Studies to pursue useless knowledge, by which he meant he spoke to a businessman and asked him at the time, 1939, who was the most important scientist in his opinion. And the businessman said Marconi, because Marconi invented the telegraph and this led to huge changes in business world. And Flexner is the name of the Institute director at the time. He told the businessman, oh, you're completely wrong, that the most important scientist as regards electromagnetic theory is Maxwell. And Maxwell, what he did, he did it entirely out of curiosity. And so what I'm hoping to revive, and I think it's contributing significantly to our problems today, is a neglect of small science, posing puzzles, uh, collaborating in small groups, making errors, and nonetheless shedding light. I think that we can improve the tuning of models significantly if we can explain some of these phenomena. I'll, I'll stop there because I'm sure you have some questions you should ask me. Thank you. Thank you, George. Uh, <clears throat> that was a fascinating. Uh, talk. Uh, we are open for questions. So unmute yourself and uh, go for it. Uh, so I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I mean, pr pr uh, a beautiful talk, by the way. Uh, from what you said, what you talked about are uh, kind of dominant interactions and uh, how is it that like uh, a large fraction of climate scientists don't focus on this interaction they do but they're very complacent about it i, I shouldn't use such adjectives uh what's lacking are people questioning and so i've, I've been at this for a while and maybe it's because i have my South African background, I'm almost allergic to advice. <laughs> so if people tell me I should do this, I, I'd rather do that. And I, I see, I'm, I'm so disappointed, especially in our students. Uh, they, everybody wishes to do what the IPCC tells them to do. And uh, <laughs> it's a terrible thing to say, but I, I think it's unhealthy. Uh, furthermore, the elite believe I'm in a bit of a bind. I've discussed this interesting with Sarajan. Uh, the elite believe we had to give advice and we need elite places indeed to, to run the country and so forth. 
but it's a thin line. We, we sort of crossed the line now. The public has lost confidence in us. And we have to get them interested. If this picture doesn't interest you, it, it, it's a picture of the seasonal cycle. And so, uh, Professor Sin and I have tried this out, and we encouraged the group in Ghana and the group in Cape Town to collaborate on comparing their seasonal cycles. And Ghana over here has a radically different seasonal cycle from the one in Cape Town. So we said, explain to each other why your seasonal cycle is so different. Uh, start by just making some measurements, the length of your shadow. Uh, well, I don't know what will work, but all I know is we've tried this and it succeeds in getting the youth interested in science. In South Africa, it succeeded spectacularly because of the horrors of apartheid. For the first time, students from different races, genders actually could mix. They go on field trips. It, it's, the main point of education to me is building self-confidence. Uh, apartheid tried to destroy it. If you tell somebody that where they live is amazing, uh, they, they perk up. Uh, you then tell them that somebody else lives in a, also in an amazing place, but it's completely different from yours. Now, at first, they, they were on Zoom, they watched each other, they wanted to see how they dress and so forth, which, which I have no problem, that's okay. <laughs> but they, I'm, I'm fishing, I, I don't have the solution yet. What I'm hoping is that pairs of groups in different climatic zones will team up to discuss these things, uh, decide for themselves what needs to be done. Uh, anything that somebody from a rich country tells them, they're reluctant to accept. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. It, it, I'm out of my depth now. I see a major problem. I'm fishing for a solution. Okay, so do, I have one more question. Like, do you think the large amount of data that's becoming accessible and uh, the development of various analytical tools will help? No, uh, study. Uh, no. It, it's helped spectacularly in the case of weather prediction. So over the two last few decades, I mean, the, the accuracy with which we can predict the hurricane, for example, is impressive. And the data in paleo is, is trivial, a tiny amount. Uh, on your laptop, you can have, they, they drill into the ocean floor in some places and into ice cores. It's a very small amount of data. The, the main problem with what I've been saying, I focus strictly on periodic forcing and response to periodic yeah. forcing. In reality, the seasonal cycle today is response to periodic forcing. It depends heavily on weather. So I've neglected high frequency flow. We don't know to what degree the high frequency, what we know for seasonal changes in weather, the high frequency fluctuations are enormously important. Yeah. Okay, I've neglected that. That's why I'm particularly interested in getting some of people in your community involved. I see an opportunity. There actually is high frequency information about the distant past is available. That they have really, we have to find out how they know what they know, as I said. But there are corals that are delivered in a certain period and from the corals they can tell you. It's a bit like three rings. But there needs to be more communication between the paleo community and what I call the reductionists. The reductionists are so pleased with their results, so intent on giving advice that they neglect this aspect. That, that's my complaint. Thank you. Further questions? No. Uh, hello. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, nice talk. Um, I really liked it. Uh, I have a question about um, modeling. Like uh, you've talked beautifully about the feedback loops um, in a system, in a, in a climatic system. Now, uh, uh, when I try to model, let's say, a feedback loop, I know how sensitive it is uh, to parameters. Any feedback loop is. Uh, it, it's quite sensitive. Um, so. With that in mind, how much trust would you put on the models that IPCC uses? And do they capture the full extent of these feedback loops? Uh, all, all models are tuned. 
mostly it, it, you can summarize the uncertainties of in one word it's clouds we don't know what to do about clouds and let me just make a comment for this week in the news there's been a big fuss about the currents in the atlantic changing and the circulation that i mentioned uh slowing down uh it's sort of a misunderstanding if you run down the equations for these things uh, pressure is the most basic parameter and if you look at any weather map it's the lines are mostly pressure the next field is wind which is the derivative of the pressure and then if you want the rainfall it's the derivative of the wind it's where the winds converge every time you take a derivative you increase noise so i would have lots of confidence in people producing pressure uh, don't buy property near the coast sea level is going to go up no doubt uh, if you're sensitive to wind it gets tricky if you're sensitive to rainfall i really have no confidence in the rainfall predictions uh, as i said the sahara 10,000 years ago had lakes uh, so the beauty of, of the paleo record is it doesn't look non-linear if i show you a, a plot of any variable buffalo new york or princeton on a daily basis you'll throw up your hands it, it looks like chaos right? uh, we anyway i, I see a room that the, the big thing the reason i have doubts about the ipcc report it's about things like rainfall uh, what they say about pressures more accurate and I did mention it to them that there was that they discuss what we agree on, and it, politically it's an extremely valuable document. But science is a matter of questioning. If, if I say something, I'm a scientist and you're a scientist, you should immediately question what I've said. So scientists organize skepticism, and I find this missing from like the IPCC report. It, it doesn't tell us what we don't know. It tries to emphasize what we think we know. The, the reason I don't think that more data will improve, we simply do not have more data. Uh, the weather prediction improved because of a huge increase in the amount of data. Uh, what is fascinating is with the virus, aeroplane flights have decreased and there's been a study the quality of daily weather forecast has actually gone down because they depend heavily on information all the time we do not have that kind of information as regards the paleo climate one question i wanted to throw at you george is uh, about the about periodicities that are so important uh, in this kind of work, right? So, and obviously, you know, sun can have a periodicity, but for you know, sitting on Earth, when you're looking at ocean temperatures, when you're looking at uh, temperatures of, of media with different densities, uh, their periodicities may initially respond to a solar periodicity of some kind, so sun-related periodicity of some kind, but it tends to have often this longer relaxation times, which you call the sawtooth structure. So my question is, are there relatively straightforward models to kind of understand this, this relaxation times uh, in, in some simplified way? Because if so, that in itself can be quite an interesting thing to know. I mean, that you would expect a, you would expect a many-body system uh, to have its own uh, characteristic response time, which is probably what these sawtooths are all about. Yeah, so, so I have a colleague, Isaac Gold, who wrote an interesting paper. He, he says the progress in biology comes from looking at really simple creatures. Like, uh, I forgot the name, something worm. Whatever. They study them in great detail. And on the basis of understanding the simple creature, they can tell us about complex organisms. And so he proposes we should spend more time with idealized models. And so meteorologists are particularly fond of 
it's only symmetric states. How do they become only asymmetric? Uh, how do you get weather and so forth? And anyway, it's from making a plea for more approaches from that side. Uh, the, the other approach, if you, if you look at the history of weather prediction, it's very interesting. It started basically with the invention of the telegraph and most meteorological units in various countries were founded in the 1860s because, because of the telegraph, they could collect vast amounts of data in one place and mm -hmm. they could produce weather maps. Then they discovered looking at these weather maps, the rules of thumb, the lows are bad, highs are good, warm fronts, cold fronts. And in England in the 1860s, the government started putting out weather forecasts that saved lives because there's lots of people crossing the English Channel or the island. They would put up a red flag if a low was approaching. Now, much of the time, it saved lives, much of the time it was wrong. Uh, what's surprising is that some professional scientists asked the government to stop this because it was based on, a comp on no understanding of highs or lows. These were just rules of thumb. Uh, the public prevailed and the forecast continued. Then the next big development was in World War II when a computer gets invented. And for Neumann started the group in Princeton. And computers were extremely weak. So they grossly simplified the equations and solved really simple equations. So for a long time, the prediction was a joke. The, the guy on TV was obliged to make some jokes in between his bad <laughs> forecast. Uh, nowadays, mayors call for the evacuation of cities if a hurricane is predicted. Uh, the, anyway, so it, it's simply a, a, a marriage. What I find impressive is that the models for weather forecasting uh, combine, the, the models get improved constantly by looking at the data. But the models are sufficiently clever that they can tell you when the data is an error. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's really a reach a very, we're nowhere close to that in climate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a couple of questions uh, on the screen. Uh, so one question is uh, from Professor Ambika. Uh, I'll read it out. Are there prominent dynamical transitions uh, over time? Well, I would claim this, uh, this Ice Age record, especially the sawtooth, uh, it, it happens abruptly on, on those timescales. We need to explore more what are the thresholds, some threshold was crossed. Uh, and then it got crossed repeatedly once you get the recurrent sawtooth signal. But the first big change was around three million years ago. No, I, I see lots of room for exploration. Uh, what I find troublesome is the lack of communication between what I call the reductionists and the descriptive people, the holistic people who tell stories, that we need to interact more with them. So, what I'm hoping of, I've discuss with Professor Sin, is to start maybe a monthly seminar where a paper is chosen beforehand, or a few papers, and one on the observational side, one on the theoretical side, and just explore. For example, the business of fires intrigues me a lot. It's a big puzzle why the savannah has so few trees, and uh, trees will overtake it turns out, and they say there are fires. And so the fire is actually a necessary part of keeping the environment the way it is. And anyway, it, it, it's something nowadays we attribute the fires to global warming. Um, maybe the fires are due to the bad management of the landscape. We have several questions here. Uh, so let me go one by one. Uh, Professor Shankar asks, a related question, can George elaborate a bit on what glacial cycles would be like 
if there were no Milankovitch forcing, that is if Earth were the only planet in the solar system? Yeah, the, I think they would, would look all that different. Uh, certain spikes would be absent and mm. it would be very irregular. But the, what we see is mostly feedbacks and then thresholds. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have completely neglected the role of high frequency changes, but there is information available for the paleo people. The, as I said, certain corals certainly grow. They, they go for a while and then they die. But well, whatever institute you are, I'm sure or there are some paleo people around. And when I was a graduate student, something intriguing happened in, in oceanography in that a, a group decided that the oceans could be treated mathematically with solved equations of motion. And there were monthly seminars between the Winter Oceanographic Institute, uh, MIT and Harvard. And they simply served the purpose of introducing people who be next to each other, to each other. And they became social occasions. You sort of re need a relaxed atmosphere. But oceanographers are probably exaggerating here. They're very romantic people. In the 60s, when you went on the ship, you didn't know where you are unless you had a sextant and stars. And so you literally took your life in your hands. If you wanted to know about variability in the ocean, you had to share your data with other people. But having taken your life into your hands to get the data, you were obviously reluctant to do so. <laughs> so anyway, it, it led to very interesting discussion and, and to interesting developments. But it, it was much more of a small science. Uh, we no longer, in some sense, anyway, I'm out of my depth here. I'm, I'm looking for ways that we can break down considerable barriers at the moment between people in different branches of science. One question from uh, Umberto. Umberto, you want to uh, ask it yourself? Sure, I typed it just in case. Uh, first yeah. of all, thank you. This has been very useful to me and it's reminded me of how important it is for us to speak to people who are uh, experts in different fields. But my question is, um, isn't the IPCC audience or the IPCC reports audience uh, different from the general scientific community? And doesn't that explain why they must emphasize where there is agreement? Yeah. No, I've, I've been, I've been influenced by a book by a fellow called the Solar Price. It's called Little Science and the Big Science. And I highly recommend that you can download it free of charge over the web. And it, it's an interesting story. He, I think he's British. He was at the University of Singapore in the 50s and the library gets closed for reconstruction purposes. And the faculty has asked to uh, take care of some of the volumes. So he asked for the proceedings of the Royal Society and they get delivered to his room. The proceedings are leather bound, go back to 1660, somewhere there. And he put them by decade against the wall. And he noticed that the doubling time, the height of the stack of volumes would double every 15 years, one five. And this astonished him because the human population doubles every 50 years, five zero, not one. And so he decided that if the Royal Society is going to keep it up, every man, woman, and dog in England will have to contribute a paper very really soon. <laughs> <laughs> and so he, he looked into who is it who writes all these papers, whom do they reference, and so forth. And he wrote his book, Small Science and the Big Science. And we organize ourselves completely differently, depending on whether we're small science or big science. If we're small science, small groups of people meet informally, exchange information, and make mistakes, and tell each other and correct it. The, our demands in terms of resources keep on increasing. And in due course, the people who provide those resources demand practical benefits. So at the moment, uh, in my experience, uh, I'm a child of Sputnik, 
And Sputnik scared the West so much that they supported small science. You could pretty much do what you liked and you could make mistakes. The end of the Cold War changed everything. And now it's big science. The IPCC is a big science body. They perform wonderfully. They do exactly what's needed politically. But I'm concerned that there's not enough support for small science. I, I do recommend this book by Sola Price. Uh, uh, it's one of the most referenced books in the field, of the science of science. He basically invented that field. Uh, but it's not known among scientists. One of your colleagues, uh, Stephen Weinberg, I think he just died a few weeks ago. I heard him say at some meeting that scientists are as interested in the history and philosophy of science as birds are in ornithology. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I hope we're not ornithologists. <laughs> so, and, and the book is The Science of Science? No, it's called Little Science into Big Science. Okay. But he, he, he claims that the Royal Society, he claims when science is small, in quotes, uh, people organize themselves informally, they have a common interest. And he says the first small science organization was the Royal Society. It was a group of people who exchanged information. And then with growth, things change. Anyway, it is a fascinating book. Thank you for that response. And I, and I wanted to briefly say that I, I, um, I, we have things in common. I grew up in a, in a developing country and, uh, and then I had the privilege of becoming a professor here in the US. And uh, I think that inspiring people in those communities, it's, it's very important and continues to be one of our uh, roles. I'm glad, which country are you from? I, I grew up in Venezuela uh -huh. and, and I left when I was 18, came to uh, undergraduate and graduate school in the US and stayed. Yeah. Okay. No, we were in very privileged positions. And one of the, the sort of prices points is that science is very much like sports. It, it's very undemocratic. A few people do most of the work. They get most of the references but they need a strong base of support. They, they're at the top of a pyramid. Mm -hmm. And unless they encourage this base, they're going to be in trouble. Uh, and at the moment we've lost the base, we're in big trouble. I, I think it might be interesting to, to, uh, for, for, uh, for you, George, to talk to Umberto about some of your educational work. He might be quite interested and that might be uh, of interest to all of us. Yeah. As I, I hope we can form some small college. Uh, in the solar prices terms, a small college just people are not necessarily next to each other. They're different. It's in, actually he calls it the invisible college. It's a group of people who get together and exchange information. Uh, I should point out they were quite nasty to each other. Newton was not a very nice man. <laughs> uh, I, and I, by the way, and I also resonate with a small group and things becoming larger. I was the founder of the planetary sciences group at the University of Central Florida, where I was the first astronomer. And for a while, there were five, six of us. Now there's 30 and the, the uh, small group interactions are breaking down. We're actually, uh, we're such a large group that I don't know what everybody's doing and the, the camaraderie is being lost. Everybody's out in their own. It's 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 one of these fragmentation problems that it's. Um, I guess at that at some point, some of us will agglomerate into smaller groups that do have this type of interaction. But I also wanted to thank uh, Surajit for inviting me to this. This is a privilege. Oh, thank you. No, okay, I'm counting on you to take the lead. The the, the solar price points out we need a balance between small science and big science. I mean, it, it was silly to criticize the IPCC. They're doing a wonderful job. They're doing exactly what's needed, but uh, they need a complementary activity. And so I don't think we can look to them, or I would even say the National Academy of Science for support for this, what, we are, what I think is needed. What's really needed is, is a small bottom-up effort. There is a question from uh, our Long Island guest, 
Uh, show me Mitra. <laughs> Go ahead, show me. No, you are muted, I think. Or if not, your volume is not right. Maybe it's okay now. No? Try it now. Can you hear me now? Yeah, now you're loud and clear. All right, good. Um, so this is more of the, uh, going back to the, uh, you know, the data regarding fluctuations and so on. It seems to me that the current narrative that is, you know, we hear and certainly, you know, non-scientists non are hearing is that the frequency of climate related fluctuations today are greater than possibly ever before. And so my question is, is there a way to tell if this is correct? Is there any way to look back at data from the distant past that provide any sort of information for decades instead of millennia, you know, length time scales? Uh, they, they are, as I said, they're corals. I think like, the changes today are so much greater than ever before. Yeah, they, these things only live for uh, I don't know, 10, 20 years, but they actually tell you about the seasonal cycle at that time. And the seasonal cycle, if you look at what determines the seasonal cycle, it's the change in obliquity and the change in eccentricity of the Earth's orbit. So there must have been significant changes in the high frequencies. The, so, so that's in the coral, coral reefs? Uh, no, that's where we are. As I said, I really don't know how they know all the things they talk okay. about. But we, we need a conversation to find out. So we know, for example, that uh, civilizations such as the Sumerian civilization or Indus Valley, I mean, significant climate changes affected them. But I don't think they have a good way to tell if it was a you know 50-year time scale or a 500-year time scale. I think. Yeah, it depends on what it is they're looking at. As I said, they they, they specialize enormously. What surprised me is. The paleo community is, for example, is a group on something called the Pliocene, which is what happened about 3 million years ago. And I would submit you cannot explain what happened in the Pliocene. And then there's a separate group that looks at the preceding period. There are committees for each that they divided the time series into, but there's a group in charge of each time period. And it's not clear they communicate with each other. And I would submit you cannot explain what happened three million years ago without looking at what came before and what came after. They tend to specialize in a manner that they know everything about conditions in a certain time without looking. I mean, uh, the seasonal cycle is an interesting case in that we, you know, the Lorenz chaos thing, we cannot predict weather for more than say 10, 20 days, if that many. However, I can confidently tell you, that it, it's now August, that December will be quite different here. So, so the seasonal cycle is, is a very strong signal. The only snag is the forecast I can make for December is the same for all December in the future. Uh, whereas this coming December may be different from others. And so uh, the climatological seasonal cycle is a very valuable one. What surprised me with the paleo record, you saw all those glacial maxima. Uh, no attempt has been made to find out what all of them have in common and how each one is distinct. And th there's no sort of global perspective on this issue. Sim similarly with the interglacials. Each interglacial, some were longer than others, the current one is particularly long. The one of 120,000 years ago was much briefer, but it was also more intense. And it turns out the eccentricity of its orbit was much bigger 120,000 years ago. So there are tests that the models need constant tuning. There are tests of this type that have not been identified or tried. So some of these, some of these claims may actually be perhaps questionable as to whether uh, this kind of climate fluctuations have actually happened in the past. That's right. Seems that, like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but specialization is 
enormous, the people who specialize on one isotope or on one particular region. Uh, the, 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 there's a need for sort of a bigger picture. By the way, this is not just climate science. Uh, I spent the last year at USAID because I, I wanted to learn about development. When you look at development, each and every thing that you can think of plays a role in even the smallest region of land and population you're looking at. You can't talk about education without children's health. You can't talk about children's health without paying attention to family structure. You can't talk about family structure without paying attention to religion. So once you start digging into this problem, there are really no experts. Everybody is sitting in their own little universe and, and trying to do their own thing, yet communication uh, becomes always a problem. And so what they try to do is they try to, to take government policies and you know take whatever guidelines that they can get from there, the problems at hand as seen by so and so many experts, and then try to marry them and, and push forward. And no wonder most development uh, efforts in the history of development efforts has been a failure. So it's the exact same problem. Uh, and in part, I blame the university structure because we, we are, you know, we, we live in narrow tunnels. And once we have to get out of our own little tunnel, we are, we are not really prepared to do that, uh, or we are not equipped to do that, even if we want to easily. Which is why, by the way, this has been a fantastic conversation. So I really want to thank all of you who have joined. And, uh, and thank you, George, uh, most importantly, for such a fantastic presentation. It's, it's, it's been such a privilege to have you. Uh, You're very kind. Now, I'm hoping that we could set up some, maybe once a month, maybe two months. We should probably circulate a paper or two to be discussed and get some people who really know about the topic. Uh, by, we have to get the youth involved. Uh, I'll just give one example. I'm, I'm a bit quite disappointed in South Africa. I, I tried to go back in 2007. I was astonished about how little it changed. And it became evident just these past few weeks. You may have read that there were riots in South Africa. And in the slums, they were burning down the supermarkets, and depriving themselves of the source of, of things they need. And all the analyses, including the New York Times, was about fights between black people. That there's a fellow who was the president for a while, and he's going back to prison, and his supporters were complaining and so on. I would submit that the origin, that nobody discussed the fact that the disparity between the rich and the poor at the moment is probably biggest in South Africa in the whole world. Since the past it ended, the rich have become richer. Uh, the poverty in the slums is such that unemployment is 30, 40%, even though there are many jobs available, but you need some, the, the crime of poverty does not to educate people. Most people can't read or write. And so the, the real crime it's not, I mean, we like to focus on blacks fighting each other. That's not the source of the problem. Uh, so in, in the case of South Africa, they could take the, anyway, it's just my personal obsession. The, if I turn to the youth, I get a far more positive response. That's more than half the world's population anyway. So, yeah. so that, the, that's where we should be. <laughs> the other thing that bugs me is this obsession with the ranking of world universities. Uh, yes. They, the the so, highest one in Africa is number 250. Its ambition is to become number 249. But who's ranking also, right? That's the other side. Yeah. So but that, well, why pay attention to anyway? Point is, education has been by the elite and for the elite for 4,500 years. If you want to change it, you have to, you have to worry about the time scale. <laughs> but I think the idea of starting some, some, uh, some seminar series dedicated to this kind of discussions on, 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 on climate and all these issues, uh, as, as you made, is, is very exciting. And let's see if we can initiate that. So with that, let me close today. today it's about 12.40 in the East Coast, uh, and, and I'm sure people are getting a little hungry here.
Uh, and so thank you, George. And uh, thanks to all of you for joining. And we'll have uh, the next session on September 11th. I think it's Phil Metzger from uh, Central Florida, who is a former NASA guy, is a statistical physicist, and is actually a lot of fun. So hopefully, uh, all of you will join us for Phil's talk on September. Thank you, and thank you very much. I'll I'll post the recording uh, in in a bit. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye bye.